Hello, Professor Avi Goldfarb, and welcome to Tech for Non-Techies. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, so I previously had your colleague, Joshua Gans, on this show, and we talked about your fabulous book, Power and Prediction. And um, then I went to see you at a University of Toronto event back in New York City about a month ago. And so I took some short videos of you speaking and I put them up on YouTube. And you know what? A couple of them went viral. Okay. <laughs> Very successful. You are now a viral YouTube superstar. Oh, <laughs> but then I thought, you know what? Um, clearly, the, like, you've got to give people what they want. <laughs> and <laughs> the people want you. Um, so for everybody, Professor Goldfarb is a professor at uh, the University of Toronto and is also chief data scientist at the Creative Destruction Lab. Am I saying that correctly? Um, yes, but I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an economist and marketing professor. Um, I talk about AI, but it's, it's more thinking about it from a management and economics point of view. Can you tell us, what is the Creative Destruction Lab? Sure. The lab is a program for science-based startups to help them scale. So the original vision of the lab came out of um, its founders, Ajay Agarwal's own uh, science, his work, and trying to understand the commercialization of science out of MIT and elsewhere. And the key insight, key insight is there is great science all over the globe. There are uh, lots and lots of universities around the world uh, that have amazing scientists and that are on the cutting edge of science. But um, commercialization, for reasons that are hard to understand, overwhelmingly happens within 25 miles of Stanford. Mm -hmm. So how do we reconcile this? There's great science everywhere with the concentration of cutting edge commercialization of science around, you know, in the Bay Area. And what he learned from his research is that part of that is um, that founders, science-based science, science -based founders uh, in the Bay Area get good advice on how to build their companies. Because when you build a company, there's all sorts of different things you could focus on, and it's hard to know what to do. And as a, if you're a scientist and you're trained as a scientist, you just assume, you know what, I'm just going to build a better mousetrap. I'm going to focus on the science and improving the, you know, improving what I'm doing, and everything else will work out. What scientists learn in the Bay Area is that that's not everything you need to build a business. And they get mentorship from people who've done it before. And so the Creative Destruction Lab, which we started in Toronto in 2012, is focused on this idea of allowing great scientists all over the world to get that kind of mentorship and advice, focus on companies. We started in Toronto. We're now in 12 sites around the world, um, including, you know, in the US, we're at Georgia Tech, University of Washington, and Wisconsin. We're at Oxford, I should say Paris, uh, Berlin, and Estonia in Europe, and, and five sites in Canada. And we are you know, focused on taking that great science that's all around the world and turning it uh, into real companies uh, that, um, you know, that have customers and earn money and grow. And since we started, uh, we have created uh, well over $20 billion in equity value from the companies that come out of our lab. And... You know, depending on how you count and what currency, it could be close to double that. Interesting, because I'd heard of the Creative Destruction Lab at Oxford, but I didn't realize it was the same thing. And the reason why I'd heard about it is that there is a venture capital fund with, I'm just going to say, a lot of money. <laughs> and like one of the big ones. Anyway, uh, so I know, I know some of those people and they came to London and one of their core things was to go to the Oxford University Creative Destruction Lab and basically just see like what was there, what they could buy and what they could invest in. And I found out about it through them, which was interesting because they came especially from the US to go check it out because I think especially in the UK, um, there is this problem with fantastic science coming out of the top universities, commercialization, being really, really behind. But it's not just at the universities, it's also at the FTSE 100. You know, if you look at the composition of the FTSE 100, which is the stock exchange in um, in the UK, that's the stock exchange composition. If you actually look at the companies listed there, they're going to be quite similar to the kind of composition you would have probably seen in the 19th century. So mining, 
real estate, finance. Yeah. And, you know, I'm like, it's not even the 20th century. It's like literally industrial revolution companies. So anyway, no wonder the UK economy is in trouble. But, you know, yeah. I spend most of my time in New York now. So that really... The, and that's, <laughs> they did it uh, to that's a story. And that's, that's exactly why, you know, our creative destruction lab at Oxford is is uh, so powerful, which is that there is uh, there is amazing science at Oxford. I think that's, you know, that's indisputable. And um, you know, commercializing that impact the economy has been has been slow. And so, what we've done as we've expanded is take the model that we built in Toronto, which is also you know I'd like to think of him professor there, a great university with great science, and figure out how to turn that into uh, companies with global ambitions that still benefit the local ecosystem. And. Well, if you manage if you manage to pull that off, especially with the with the local ecosystem, your government is going to be very very happy. Um, so now going to that one of the clips I remember that went viral on YouTube. It was you talking about ChatGPT. So my first question is, do you personally use ChatGPT? And if yes, then what for? Um, I use it. So I use it all the time. Um, you know, certainly daily, if not multiple times a day. And a lot of what I do is, let's call it low value writing. So look, I'm a professor. My job is, is to come up with ideas, write them down and communicate. And, um, but much of that communication doesn't really require expert skills in writing. It's here's some notes. Let's figure out how to you know, get that out efficiently. But I used to spend hours crafting emails, writing reviews and things like that. I don't have to do that anymore. I write down my point form, point form notes and say, you know, turn this into a well-crafted email or, you know, frame this as an academic review or whatever else. And it creates a document that's well-written, perfect grammar, well-structured. I do have to read it. So I'm not at a point where I'm comfortable just sending it without reading it, but uh, it saves hours on all that low value uh, writing. But there is a debate in academia right now because there are there are people like you on one side who are saying this is great, it's saving me time and it's saving students time. So let's get students to use it. And then there's the other side that's basically saying let's completely ban it. And I mean, my views. I remember when my mother used to try to ban me from things when I was a teenager, <laughs> and I mean that didn't work. <laughs> I think that was probably it was like challenge accepted. So, it, yeah, please, please. It makes no sense to me to ban it. Um, and here's why, which is once our students graduate, they're going to use this tool. And our job is to train them for a work world where they will have this tool available to them. And so writing uh, grammatically correct sentences and well-structured five paragraph essays is no longer a meaningful advantage. And they need to figure out what that meaningful advantage looks like. And so do we as professors, we need to change our assignments. Uh, but you know, what I told my students when they asked me if they could use ChatGPT, my response was, you know, of course, and I expect you to, and there's no excuse anymore for bad grammar, bad spelling and poorly ways. All you have to do is spend five minutes to enter what you are writing into ChatGPT and say, structure this into a proper essay and you'll get a result. And so um, this, you know, I'm clearly you know, banning things is, is not working, um, but it, it's not the right thing to do. Instead, we now, you know, the expectations and what high quality means for an assignment for my students, that's just different. And it's a little work, more work for me because I have to think more creatively about my assignments. But it's fantastic. And what it, even in the first year of it, what I saw that it could do is, look, in Toronto, many of our students um, are not from Canada. English is not their first language. And it was hard to parse the, uh, did they, were they brilliant and had great ideas from their ability to write well. Mm -hmm. And what I, what I learned from some of the assignments that came in is, now I don't have to worry about that. And many of the students whose language skills weren't that good generated amazing essays. Not, and I, not because 
they just said, hey, here's the assignment, chat GPT, write the essay. Because if they did that, I would have. Uh, but bring specific ideas from class, from their own personal experience, et cetera, and crafting an amazing assignment um, that you know allowed the, their creativity to really take off. It was, it was fantastic. And I'm yeah. tweaking my assignments for next year and looking forward to how this all plays out. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more of it. And in your, in your book, I'm just going to have it here. In your book, Power and Prediction, the, the Disruptive Economics of Artificial Intelligence, you talk about point solutions and system solutions. So is ChatGPT a point solution or a system solution? Uh, ChatGPT is a solution. Okay, and, it is neither. Uh, then it depends good. on how you use it. Okay, so we are right, just like any other. So the the idea, so a point solution is you look at your existing workflow, you find some human process, you take out that existing process, you drop in a new process, and you keep everything else the same. So what we mean by a point solution is you're not delivering, you're doing what you always did, but there's one particular thing you used to do that you're doing incrementally better because of technology. For example. For example, um, a point solution in a talking about is we are are going to hand in the exact same you know hand in the assignments that we always did and they're going to cheat because they're going to use chat gpt so it's going to be hey you know they had to write five paragraph essays and they're going to do that again and they're going to use the technology we worry about that so it's or, like a calculator like using a like, calculator. Calculator. like if your maths yeah. professor from the i don't know 1700s gave you a math problem uh, yeah and you traveled in time got a calculator then that's a point then you would do that calculator a little bit better or even something like what I was describing, which is I used to write emails. Sometimes they took me you know, 10, 15, or even 20 minutes to craft it if it was an important one. Uh, now it takes me three minutes, but effectively my workflow hasn't changed. Mm -hmm. That's a point solution. A system solution is um, let's think through, now that we can do writing at scale, what kind of new business opportunities arise? And um, in in many cases, there are people who, if you can think about um, entire uh, industries that can be transformed because the people who are left out of it because their inability to write uh, is is different. So uh, take a, there was this story on Twitter ago, it may or may not be true, but it's, it's, a, it's a great parable um, it, uh, regardless which is there was this uh, landscaper who was a very skilled landscaper, uh, but his language skills were terrible. And he had a very hard time getting clients and keeping clients because his, uh, his correspondence on email and chat was incomprehensible. Uh, a colleague, friend, mentor of his uh, integrated his email with GPT-3, with OpenAI. He could write his terribly written notes. They would be turned into a well-crafted email that would then be sent to the client. Great. That enabled him to get much more business and a different kind of business that was higher skilled potentially because now people would, you know, the barrier of, hey, this guy doesn't know how to communicate. Do I really trust him with my, you know, uh, with my garden? Uh, and now he could just cut the lawn. Well, now he could take advantage of the other skills, build a different kind of business potentially because of uh, what language models here allowed him to do. So the this is an interesting example because I was expecting you to give an example from, I don't know, the media or law, basically something where people write a lot, whereas this is actually well, manual labor. And so it just shows that actually this, this tool and this change, it's beyond the expected. Yeah, yes. And it, um, no. so you can think about optimistic and pessimistic stories uh, and optimistic and pessimistic transformation. So a lot of the pessimism is let's think about the people whose core job does what ChatGPT does. And there's reasons for those kind of people to worry. If you're a journalist, where an editor gives you a prompt, hey, write a story about this, and then you write the story, then the editor reads it before deciding to publish, uh, then you have reasons to worry. That, you know, your point <laughs> in the workflow is automatable. If you're the editor, you're now in a different world. If you're the editor, you can create the prompt. You no longer have to pay the journalist. 
uh, you can create the prompt, read what comes out of it. Uh, and your job fundamentally as a point solution doesn't change. But then you can go to another step. Well, now that you can get those stories written instead of in however much time it required a human journalist to do it uh, instantly, well, now you can do a lot. You can think creatively about stories. You can uh, think about uh, the design of the interface or the media interface differently because you can create things so quickly and at scale. What exactly that looks like, the problem with system solution is if it hasn't happened yet, I don't know what it looks like. Um, but you can imagine that creating incredible opportunities for entirely. We have a few solutions we've already seen because of AI. Advertising today is very different than advertising was 40 years ago. Um, and a lot of that has to do with prediction technology, not so much generative models. And generative models may do, you know, may bring that to another layer, which is um, a lot less uh, wheeling and dealing like you may have saw in, if, if you remember the show Mad Men. And, and a lot more, um, my students don't remember Mad Men anymore. It's like <laughs> hard to get my head around. Um, and a lot more soft, um, data-driven advertising. You break up a little bit. So what you're saying is that um, from the Mad Men era, so it was basically the Mad Men era until fairly recently. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, if you people, if you haven't seen Mad Men, then you should, like, what are you doing with your life? <laughs> Get it on HBO. <laughs> it's amazing. Even if you just watch it for the clothes and the beautiful people, you could just watch it with the sound off because that is so visually stimulating. But it began in the 50s and essentially the advertising industry and kind of like the magazine industry also, so the media industry didn't really change that much until essentially Facebook really came along, well, Facebook and Google, so those two. Absolutely. And, and that was, there were a handful of different technologies, but a big part of that was prediction, was machine prediction, predicting, hey, here's a user who's arrived at a website, uh, who are they and what are their interests? And once you could do that with software, then you could deliver a different kind of advertising and do it uh, more efficiently and measure it in a way that was always impossible. Interesting, thank you. And by the way, I can see that there are some people here who might want to ask questions. So if you want to ask questions, just put up uh, your hand. So just do raise hand and then I will unmute you and then you can ask your question. I, otherwise I will keep on asking questions. So. As I mentioned, you talked about system solutions and point solutions. Are there other solutions or is that the only thing? Well, there's somewhere in the middle, um, which is what we call application solutions, which is um, you know, taking one piece of your workflow and doing that much better and more efficiently, but not really um, you know, sort of transforming the entire business model. So in you know, we, we came up with this framework in thinking about electricity where the point solution, so in the old days, like 150 years ago, in a factory, uh, they were powered by steam typically, sometimes a water wheel, but typically steam. And there was a steam engine at the center of the factory. And the uh, every single machine in the factory was connected by these belts to this central steam engine. And so the, the logic of production in the factory was determined by the power needs of the machines, essentially because energy dissipates with distance. Um, you want to have your power hungry machines as close as possible to the power source. With steam, uh, the logic of the factory was determined by the power needs of the machine. And so in what you had at first were point solutions where you took out a steam engine, dropped in an electric motor, but kept the rest of the factory exactly the same. You still had the belts and you still had all these connections and energy still dissipated with distance, uh, but um, you had an electric motor at the center. Mm -hmm. That's a point solution. Mm -hmm. An application solution was, well, now a bunch of inventors realized that they could invent new machines within the factory. And so you could take out whatever process you had that was connected to a belt uh, to the main power source, plug it in, and build a different kind of process for each task within the factory. But the overall workflow didn't change. That's an application solution. Mm -hmm. a, a system solution was that well, the location of the machines doesn't need to be determined by the power needs. Mm -hmm. We can build an entirely new kind of factory. Mm -hmm. The 20th century factory with like Henry Ford style with inputs in one end and outputs out the other, that could exist because of electricity. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, for AI, 
what we're seeing so far are for the first 10 years from like 2012 to 2022 we were seeing a lot of point solutions mm -hmm. where uh let's do everything we did before but have a machine uh replace the human uh, but not really mess with it, anything in the workflow and not really have a new invention so a bit like chat box when you have you know you're, you're stuck and you have a question is yeah that, is that why you're going with this so with it would be more like the chatbots that provide customer support for mm -hmm. the support for uh, for customer service representative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like right? you so can your password and all of that fun. Yeah, they just just help a little bit. The application solution is going to say, you know, here's a company that's providing a product that takes that entire task out of your existing workflow uh, and does it by AI. So that's where we have. Uh, not just a chatbot supporting an existing customer service rep, but um, automating a big part of that, uh, of your workflow so that you um, you no longer need a human in that loop. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, um, like for example, uh, when Zoom scaled during the pandemic, um, part of what enabled them to scale was they had an automated um, customer service system mm -hmm. for most queries. It was from a, a Canadian company, one of, one of the graduates of our lab named Data Support. And um, that was an application solution within Zoom's workflow mm -hmm. that enabled anybody having a password query or a login query to have their things done automatically so that the customer service people could focus on the higher value. And, and then the system solution, again, would be to rejig how the entire workflow operates. Don't have that in this particular, you, know, you can imagine one, uh, to create a new kind of industry. Mm -hmm. And so is this already happening? Are these kind of system solutions, do they exist anywhere? Or is it something that we're moving towards gradually, but it doesn't yet exist? Uh, we are moving toward it gradually. We have examples. Mm -hmm. So the examples we have, I already talked about the advertising industry. So that has been completely appended and transformed because of prediction technology. So that is one system solution we have. It is now central to advertising. Mm -hmm. And 40 years ago, tech almost a meaningful role in thinking about how we sell advertising and measure its outcome. You know, it's funny you say this because literally next week I'm going to the Cannes Lions Festival of Creativity. So that is basically the like the Oscars of the advertising industry, and it happens to be in the French Riviera. So you know, wow. gotta go. <laughs> it's gonna be terrible, I promise. And um, every time I go, like I'm always impressed that the fact that basically it's the tech companies that literally rent beaches. And, you know, these are not cheap beaches. These are like the most expensive beaches in the world. And so I know this year Amazon is taking a beach. Obviously, Meta is taking one. I don't know if Twitter is going to have their beach. Usually it was fun, but you know, <laughs> there, might be, um, there might be a bit more humble this year. Who knows? But anyway, and the ad agency is a kind of, you know, they have shrunk their they're, they're just on the super yachts. But what I find interesting is that despite AI, despite digital technologies, despite all of that, there are still traditional advertising agencies who are frankly making enough money to rent a super yacht for a week and entertain people with champagne. So this is what I'm really curious about. What do you think? Like why, why in an industry that has been so visibly disrupted by technology and AI, are there still the madmen who are, you know, they're not earning as much as they used to, but they're still earning a hell of a lot. Um, so there's still a role, like there's still a fundamental role for creativity. What's changed and what's transformed the industry is that there's a lot more measurement um, and the way uh, ads are delivered uh, is personalized and different. And so, um, you know, it, the, uh, we still had telephone operators in the 90s 
Uh, the telephone switch, the first automated telephone switch was uh, invented in uh, 1890. So it took 80 years to automate the last person. That's not to say that uh, the technology, the telephone system uh, you know, wasn't transformed over the course of that you know, 80 year period. And so the fact that there's still some people who do very well, like, but okay, sure. But if you think about the the essence industry, mm -hmm. who profits, yeah. how things are sold, it's an entirely new world than it was 40 years ago. And that's what we think about the system level change. Uh, but creativity is still part of it. Absolutely. And uh, there are still people literally paying, I don't know, 10 grand or whatever it is for an ad in the New York Times, just the way they used to. So it's interesting yeah. that the industry has been massively disrupted, but there are still remnants, remnants of a bygone age, perhaps. Absolutely. Absolutely. And are there other industries bought from advertising that are, sure. that have really gone through this system change? Yeah. Um, so, um, so you've, you've been to London, England, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm currently in London, England, where there is currently. Okay. So navigating London, England is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, getting, and if you wanted to be a taxi driver in London, England, uh, it, has historically been three years of school. Yes, to get the knowledge. To get the knowledge, exactly. So you need, in the first year, you just, you're in a classroom, you pour over maps, and year two, you get to go on a moped and drive around the city. And then in year three, it's a real apprentice program. But it's three years of training. What are they training to do? They're training to understand the how to get from point A to point B in London. Okay. You know, their brains actually change. Have yeah, you seen that? that, that um, I forgot the term but anyway it's a latin medical term but essentially the taxi drivers the london black cab drivers their brains physically change shape because they have to retain so much information no it's so it's incredible what they know right now um about 10 years ago two technologies came along the ability to do digital dispatch and the ability to predict the best route from point A to point B. Uh, those two technologies originally were used as a point solution. And cab drivers around the world got to be better at going from point A to point B, saving you know 5% of time, being empty less often because of the digital dispatch. They did a little bit better. Uh, that, now, what we had though, in fact, was a system solution. Right now, anyone who knows how to drive can find the most efficient way to get from point A to point B in just about any city in the world. Mm -hmm. And so what originally happened with, uh, with digital dispatch and, and you know, navigational predictions is that it empowered professional drivers to be a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But what it really did is enabled amateur drivers to be almost as good as professionals mm -hmm. to the point where now we have, instead of hundreds of thousands of cab drivers in the US, millions of people who are professional drivers, um, because ultimately the prediction technology enabled them to do something entirely different and create a whole new industry uh, that Uber and Lyft and others have developed. And so when we think about these system solutions, it's, uh, just to be clear, that's, that's kind of similar to the story I told you about the landscaper, right? You know, uh, which is that there were people who have landscaping businesses who are good at you know, some other skill writing, uh, mm -hmm. they're going to do a little worse. Mm -hmm. uh, the other is empowered. We have a similar story here, which is that there's lots of people who know how to drive. Mm -hmm. That's not a rare skill. Mm -hmm. uh, navigating a city like London is a rare skill. Mm -hmm. um, but the the real advantage of that compared to 10 years ago or 20 years ago is, you know, has shrunk completely because anybody can really get around a city now. Mm -hmm. uh, because of prediction. So the system level change in personal transportation is enabling millions of amateur drivers to become professionals. And it's interesting because in that example, you know, black cabs have now become a luxury. So, you know, if you are, for everybody who wants to really impress a woman, do not call an Uber, get a proper London black cab. It's more expensive, but it's nice. It's good service. It's like, that's the thing you're supposed to do. But, you know, if you're just going out with your friends, get an Uber. It's fine. 
And so now we're kind of in this situation where humans and the human touch, that's the luxury experience. And then AI, that's kind of your everyday standard basics. Is that a statement that you would agree with? Um, it's true in that particular context. Uh, I'm trying to think if it's universally true. Um, it's often true. I'm sure if I thought hard enough, I could come up with a counterexample. But I, I like, as a general rule, the um, this is something that is often true about software, mm -hmm. which is um, as technology advances and software can do more, it mimics what the super rich used to get. Mm -hmm. um, it's a version of the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe we can see something like that with AI, that a lot of what's happening is uh, we're all going to get the service that, you know, so we have these you know, professional concierge services. Mm -hmm. uh, well, now maybe with Google Bard, we'll all get uh, something like a concierge. Um, that I mean, I'm dreaming is, of Butler. I don't know what everybody else is, but. Or you know. Yeah. Right. Well, quite Alexa's easy. nice, but a real butler and you know a proper outfit that'll be fantastic. <laughs> okay, so everybody, this is your last chance to ask questions. If you want to ask a question, then please do the little raise hand thing at the bottom. And I want to ask, uh, what do you think of this letter that Sam Altman and a bunch of you know tech people wrote, basically? disparaging AI, but after they've basically invented it, made loads of money from it, and then they're like, oh, it's a bad thing. Oh. Okay, so uh, you mean the 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 petition to slow down AI? Yes. Okay, so I think just to... Um, no, it was Elon Musk who signed it. 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 was Elon Musk, but... It was Elon, uh, yes. Okay, so... Not Tamar, uh, you're right. So that, that letter... Um, so that letter highlights three core risks. Okay. And economists have something to say about each of these three risks. So the core risks in that letter are, number one, should we build machines uh, that can outsmart us and potentially take over the world? Number two, should we build machines that can generate massive amounts of information so that uh, people get fooled all the time? And number three, should we uh, create machines that will take all the jobs, especially the good ones? Okay. Um, so on the first question, should we build machines that can take over the world? There's a, I'm not sure that's, I don't quite see that as imminent, but you know, there's some smart people on that. So maybe that's not prediction machine, GPT, but maybe it is imminent. Um, and if it is, I don't have much to say about it, except it's not necessarily bad. So the economics research papers that look at what happens when we have a machine that essentially can, say, invent and create new things without human intervention, that leads to a very good world, not a very bad world. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's a, if there's an alignment issue, uh, that's a first order issue, which is, is this machine gonna, gonna listen to us and do what we want? But an intelligent machine the, the simple economics of intelligent machines, not the political science of it, but the economics of it, is this is a wonderful world where we'll have spectacular abundance. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Political science is not to worry about. Yeah, uh, so basically the Adam Smith way of like the trickle down effect, somehow the, um, anyway, but that, that's another discussion. Yeah, so you're saying the second point is. Okay, so uh, the second point is misinformation. Mm -hmm. In the short run, for sure, people will get fooled because they're not used to how this, you know, what kind of misinformation can be created. But that can't be where things land. If we know, you know, over time we'll learn uh, that we can trust certain things and we can't trust other kinds of digital information. So the first pass is, oh no, you worry that somebody's gonna blackmail you because they're gonna doctor an image. Uh, if you think about it carefully, you'll actually land on, oh no, it's gonna be impossible to blackmail anybody because no one will believe any images they see. Mm -hmm. So where we land in terms of once we understand how much, uh, what's possible with misinformation, we're going to, uh, we're not going to land in a world where everybody gets fooled all the time. Mm -hmm. There might be extra costs in interacting with your bank. You might have to do three extra clicks or something, mm -hmm. but it's not, it's not um, a disaster scenario. Mm -hmm. People will get fooled. So it's not like totally rosy, but it's not a disaster scenario for the long run. 
Then the third one on whether will there be jobs, um, the first thing to recognize is that's a strange question. So have you seen the movie The Matrix? I assume you have. Yes, of course. Yeah, of course. Um, every human in that movie has a job mm -hmm. from the day they're born to the day they die. And we serve as batteries in that movie, mm -hmm. uh, but that is not considered utopian. Mm -hmm. right? It's not considered a good thing that everybody has a job. We, we view that as a bad thing. Uh, work, you know, a job is, is work. It's not fun. And so it's not obvious as a first pass if we have the things we need, whether it's a bad or good thing to have jobs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, an existential question is that man's search for meaning. Do is we need a job work? to have meaning? I <laughs> not, uh, but maybe. And then the, uh, I would argue that most people don't, well, who knows? Hey, that's that's outside my expertise. I, I would like to hope we don't need jobs to have meaning. Um, but then even if, even notwithstanding that and say the goal is jobs, uh, the um, economic history, like what's happened in the past and our understanding of how the economy works tell us that uh, as one thing gets automated, other parts of the economy grow. Mm -hmm. When agriculture got more efficient, manufacturing grew. As manufacturing got more efficient, services grew. As some services got more efficient, healthcare and education grew. Mm -hmm. And so there's no, it's not like there's a finite number of jobs that are going to get automated. There's going to be plenty of jobs. Mm -hmm. The thing to worry about is whether uh, that future world has increased or decreased inequality. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, especially, you know, equality of opportunity and, and even of outcome. That's, um, and there's forces going both ways um, there. So that, that's like a, you know, a two-hour you know, economic lecture on how to understand those various pieces. But at a high level, the reasons to be pessimistic are number one, people own machines and the machines are profitable. Like people own the AIs and the AIs are profitable. And so those people will do even better. That mm -hmm. increases inequality. Um, in the past, if you think about computing and the internet, people who are good at abstract thinking did better and better and better. That increased inequality is called skill bias technical change. If we think AI is going to be like computing in the internet, again, another reason to expect inequality. Mm -hmm. The reasons to be hopeful are, well, electricity actually decreased inequality. And, um, and especially the technologies that diffused after the, ninth, after the Second World War decreased inequality. Um, and uh, there's no reason why. And if you look at what AI does, a lot of what it does is automate tasks that are done by high wage people. Mm -hmm. And so maybe that will uh, empower, as we've talked about the, these stories, uh, everybody else to be able to be more productive in their work by uh, being able to do some of the skills that currently command a high wage. You know, this kind of reminds me of um, a talk that one of my favorite professors from my days at the University of Chicago gave. So, you know, if you know him, um, Michael Gibbs, he is. He's very much loved and adored. And I remember he was giving this lecture, probably gonna get it wrong, and he's showing these slides and then he says, well, and then in the 20th century, there was this big exogenous, there was this big shock to the labor force and this new technology entered the market and it was a really, really big disruption and it changed things. And, and we're all like, ooh, what? And I think it was kind of like in about the 1950s, he was showing this graph of the US and we're all like, what was it? Was it like, the bomb? <laughs> what, what was it? And then he said, it was women entering the workforce. And he said that actually, and I was like, I'm a new technology. You're new to Quite fun. <laughs> I've been called many other things, but this is a new one. <laughs> and what he said was that at the time, and he actually showed us newspaper clippings of men basically say what will happen to our jobs when this new technology in the form of women enters the workforce you know we're all going to be out of our jobs bad things are going to happen like no must keep them at home but you know with this new technology we seem to be doing quite fine the the economy in the us at least is still growing yeah. and i think I, I mean that always stayed with me that this fear of change leading to they're all going to take our jobs i mean that's literally how populist movements are born that's that's how that that phrase has been the foundation of so much unrest 
for probably millennia. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the anxiety and it's part of it is we can all imagine what, uh, what will get worse. Mm -hmm. but we can't imagine uh, the things that we'll be able to do that we can't do today. Oh, uh, isn't that sad? That is, that is the case with the human condition. Like we can imagine the bad thing, but we can't imagine the good thing. It's, it's sad, but it's, it's a harder, like, it's just an intellectually harder exercise. You know, we, we know, uh, you can say, Hey, here are the things I do. Uh Oh, AI is going to do that. Mm -hmm. That's bad. Mm -hmm. Here are the things that don't exist yet. Mm -hmm. Once you can imagine them, then they exist. <laughs> well, it's kind of like the jobs of the future, because, you know, uh, at Tech for Techies, usually, I mean, the audience is mainly people who are business people who were kind of like, like I was, I did my MBA at Chicago Booth, and we did lots of stuff about business, obviously, economics, finance, nothing about technology. And so when I then started a tech company, despite not knowing anything, <laughs> and, I had to learn along the way. That's when I found that my classmates were like, oh crap, can you tell us too? Like what is, what's happening? And I find that quite a lot of people, uh, you know, when we were coming out of college, the options that we were pursuing, it was like investment banking or consultancy, maybe advertising. We didn't know about product managers, data science. Okay, maybe it existed in some kind of random place at a university but it wasn't really a thing the way it is now. So when people think about the future of jobs, it's exciting to think that there are going to be jobs invented in 20 years time that we can't even imagine yet. Absolutely. And there's a, a study by David Otter at MIT that a substantial fraction of the, you know, today's workforce does jobs that didn't exist before mm -hmm. the second world war. Okay. Like, 50% you know, or plus, depending on how you count. And so with technological change and with, you know, advances in society, we, we invent entirely new things to do. And before we can, before we know what those are, it's very hard to imagine how that all, how that will all play out. And it's much too easy to be pessimistic. Well, that concludes my question. So if anybody has a final question, just do the little raise hand thing at the bottom and then I will unmute you. I know we've got some smart, educated people on here. So uh, I'd love to hear your questions. Um, but otherwise, speak now or forever hold your peace. <laughs> and um, I am going to go out for dinner and drink champagne. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, enjoy. Great to have you. <laughs> Um, have a fantastic day. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Take care. Bye.